Good evening. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> and welcome to this May 28th uh, council uh, meeting, public hearing, and public forum. And I'm very happy to see you all here today. And we are um, beginning the evening with the Pledge of Allegiance in honor of Memorial Day and in honor of the men and women of our armed forces who passed away, especially those who gave their lives in the line of duty. And joining us in the pledge are several Boy Scouts from the Sisquan uh, Lodge, number 253. And so I would invite you all from the lodge to come forward. And the Sisquan uh, Lodge number 253 is known as the Grandfather Lodge of the Pacific Northwest. It was one of the oldest continually run lodges in the Northwest and they recently celebrated 75 years of service to Oregon. As Scouting's National Honor Society, the lodge's mission includes the promotion of camping, responsible outdoor adventure and environmental stewardship and the development of character, spirit and ability to fulfill a life of purpose of leadership in service to others. The young men representing the Sisquan Lodge and leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance this evening are Mason Robbins, Blaine Loftus, Robert Scheideck, Dylan Herleman, Ashton Lamy, Eric Amasher, Aiden Stubbs, Tycho Legru, and Jacob Legru. And now, if you would please join us, turning to the flag, which is this one, <laughs> behind you, <laughs> and please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Well done, gentlemen. Guys. Thank you very much. Okay, great, thank you. Now all order of the arrow, which is not an easy accomplish. What the heck does this corn mean? <laughs> All right, while everyone sorts themselves out, we have a, we have a public hearing. All right, folks, if you could settle down. I know that was exciting. Um, we're gonna just do a little bit of council business so that, it's, so that we have that taken care of uh, before we go on into the public hearing. And so the first item is the consent calendar. And um, yes. Can't hear anything out here. Okay. All right. I will speak louder. And is that better? Yes. Okay. Excellent. All right. Okay. I move approval of the items on the consent calendar. Second. Alan? I'd like to pull item C. Okay. C. So we can speak to it. All right. All in favor of the cons consent calendar minus item C. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, thank you very much. And so, Councilor Zelenka, you want to speak to item C? Yeah, I don't have a problem with item C. Actually, I, I pulled it because I think these types of things should be celebrated. So, uh, this is our Eugene Springfield one year action plan for affordable housing. And I'm wondering if Mr. City Manager could have someone come up from staff and, and talk about this and tell us what this is because I think it, it merits having some uh, um, uh, publication about the good work that we're doing in this area. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Stephanie Jennings, and I'm the grants manager for the city of Eugene and uh, manage the team that implements the use of the HUD funds. And so each year, the city of Eugene uh, receives uh, allocations of federal uh, CDBG funds and home funds. CDBG stands for Community Development Block Grant. And HOME is actually not an acronym, it's just called the HOME program and it's specifically for affordable housing. And so the action plan allocates just about $4 million in these resources uh, to strategies that were approved by council in 2015 uh, to uh, impact affordable housing, human services, and economic prosperity activities. Uh, these are a range of programs. Some of them are grants 
grants. Uh, some of them are loans, uh, typically for grant programs. Those resort, those uh, uh, projects come back to council for approval uh, at a later point in time or have already been approved by council. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. That's just $4 million for this year. Yes. Words affordable housing projects. Yes. Yes. Every year. Thank you. Okay. I just yeah. want to say something. Yes, uh, Councillor Semple. Thank you, Councillor Zelenka, for pulling this. Um, I read the whole thing, and um, I was really impressed both with the goals and with the one-year plan, uh, the selection of projects, and the amount of money that I don't think people are aware of. Four million dollars going to a lot of homeless and transitional housing job. Uh, that we need a lot of those things. So I'm glad that we are pulling it out and putting some light on it because it is something to celebrate and realize that it's one of our resources for this big challenge. So thank you. Okay. Yes. I guess, Stephanie, every five years we do a consolidated plan, so that's when the council will get more engaged in, in the revamp of this next iteration <coughs> of the plan, which will be next year. Yes. So uh, council last approved the consolidated plan in May 2015, and so we're on track to have uh, council consider it again uh, in May 2020. We typically do about a 12-month process that has pretty extensive community engagement, strategy development, uh, and in the last planning process, we did three work sessions with council uh, on the planning process. Uh, so it is an opportunity to look uh, in depth at the uses of funds over the past five years, think about the priority needs uh, within the community and to identify the strategies and goals that uh, Eugene wants to pursue for the next five years. Yeah, I think that the, uh, the this often o gets overlooked when we're talking about affordable housing and all the tools conversation <laughs> that we're having, and this is something that is on an ongoing basis, but it's incredibly important. It does a lot of amazing good work for our community and creating affordable housing opportunities for people. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion on the table to approve this final item. So, oh, I move to approve. Item C. Item C. Item C. Second. All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six. Thank you, and that passes. Thank you very much for bringing that to to the, everyone's attention. Okay, I have now will formally open the public hearing, and just a. Hopefully you're all aware, we actually did switch the normal order of things. We're having the public hearing first and the public forum second because the public hearing is time sensitive. Wanted to make sure that we got that uh, through and the public forum is uh, readily available every couple of weeks. So wanted to make sure there was time for the public hearing first. So we are beginning with that. I'm formally opening. Uh, no, no, you, no, okay. no. But there is staff. There is staff in the back. If you have questions about process, I will. I'll make it all clear to you as I go. So I'm opening the public hearing. Those wishing to speak during the public hearing must submit a completed request to speak form to the information desk prior to the beginning of the public hearing. When you come to the podium, please give your name, city of residence, and for Eugene residents, your ward if known. You will have three minutes to comment. There are lights on the timer. The red light indicates the end of the three minutes. And we have 28 speakers signed up for this. So I'll read two names at a time so the second person can be ready to step up as soon as the first person ahead of you is finished. First up, we have Janet Ayers, followed by Richard in Love. Janet Ayers. Do I have to see? You can, well, you, we, we want to be sure to hear you in the mic, so sitting probably is wise. Janet Ayers and uh, Board 7, Claire Surrett, although I haven't talked to her in some time. I've called you a couple of times, Claire. Uh, what I wish to address is this payroll tax and how it affects people, working people. Um, we have, I believe, four bond measures right now. I am a property owner in the Whitaker area. I have a duplex property. It's an investment property. I live on one side. 
rent out the other. And I have a real concern with how the police services, what the directives are being given to law enforcement in enforcing uh, the blue tarps and the tents and the damages that come to a community with the problem that we have. I'd like to know uh, what the city, in terms of de-incentivizing additional people coming, housing is fine and well, but uh, my concern <coughs> is going to create a floodgate, and I'd like to be uh, more informed with what the city's doing on that front. Also, in their efforts, law enforcement, I'm a frequent caller. Uh, because of the Whitaker neighborhood is the main magnet for this, including the rail tracks all over. Uh, my dad brought us here in the 60s, and it was a very beautiful, viable city. It was the Emerald City. I can't say that about it anymore. I'd like to know what the city is doing to prevent uh, this, and I'd like to suggest your wheel that you present 65 cents of the dollar going to police uh, court, 15 cents. I'd like prevention being given that 15 cents, and I'd like to see the homelessness at seven cents. I'd like that to go to the court, and the homeless piece of it, three cents, because I think we need to start being a, more proactive in keeping this from germinating and creating uh, a counterbalance in those that are working in the city and paying taxes and those that are not. I don't want this to become a mecca for people that are not going to be contributing to society. I'll be working till I'm 95. Also, I want to know what the policy is. The police have been wonderful. The few that we have out there to clean up these camps, and they're gone for a day or two, and they go focus on another one. And it's like Keystone Cops. They clean up that one, and within three days, they sprung back up again. It's a total loss of resources. The police should not be having to go down like Keystone Cops, springing it up. We should have a policy that stops it once and for all. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Next up is Richard Inlove, <clears throat> followed by Michael Clues. And I realized that as I was introducing this, I failed to say we are talking about the Community Safety Services payroll tax and adding new sections to the Eugene Code 1971. Sorry, just in case anyone's wondering why they're testifying, that's what's up. Okay, Richard Inlove, please. Yes, thank you first, first of all for having this meeting. Appreciate it and are allowing us to uh, interact with you. Um, I also live in the Whitaker. I've lived there for 13 years, and um, my rent's going up $50 every year. I'm uh, fixed uh, income as far as Social Security. I'm working for the 4J School District in transportation. I'm uh, in good health, and I keep my health well by eating well and doing things that are beneficial to my health. So um, I plan to, if I can, because they don't have a retirement age, I can work there until I'm 75. But I'm not going to be living in that apartment because by in a few years it's going to be $800, and I'm not going to be able to afford that. So right now, I'm planning to buy a trailer and live in a trailer. So I don't know how you're going to deal with that. But I'm going to be a homeless person living in a trailer, but still working in Eugene and paying taxes and contributing to this community with thousands of dollars every every year. So I would like to see. Um, also, uh, I'd like to see how the city's going to try to help people who are, going to be, who are on the verge of becoming homeless, how you're going to facilitate us not to become homeless, and if we do become homeless, in what way can we uh, still live in a way that's responsible and help the city? Like, I, if I lived in a trailer, I would keep my trailer clean. I would clean up after myself. And also, I, uh, I'm a little concerned about that. Um, I understand that we have to help the homeless, but I also echo what Janet said as far as that we don't want to invite them if they're, if they're saying, hey, I'm getting so many things here in Eugene. Come to Eugene. They'll provide so many things for you. So I don't want it to, that to be a magnet for people who aren't willing to contribute to the community by working. So that is my concern. Uh, and the way things are going, even though I'm working at 4G and it's a union, my wages are not going up. They don't even match the minimum wage increase. So what's going on is that Minimum wage is rising, we're sinking. And that's what we're starting to say. Other things are rising, we're sinking. And this is what's going to be happening here. This is not good. 
So I'm just wanted to say that to you. That's the reality. Okay, I'm contributing 13 years. I <laughs> don't have any police record, so I've been a, a responsible person. I appreciate that. Thanks. Thank you. Michael Clues, followed by Brittany Quick Warner. I'm not sure I need a microphone. Good evening. My name is Michael Clues, and I am the president of the Eugene Police Employees Association. Tonight, I would like to share with you the community safety initiative for what it means to the people that I represent. Station one to any unit that can clear and respond. A phrase spoken by dispatchers who are desperately trying to find available officers to go to priority calls. These calls could be anything from a physical dispute to a burglary in progress to a homicide. These, this phrase is not new to dispatch, yet my 17 and a half years of being a police officer, it is used with significantly greater frequency. In 2002, when I first started, if you heard the phrase once a week, it was unusual. Today, hearing the phrase once an hour, possibly multiple times an hour, is a common occurrence. It is an anecdotal, anecdotal measurement stick to the numbers presented to council by both Executive Director David James and Chief Chris Skinner. They are, in the past five years, 911 calls for Eugene have increased 21%, while police and 911 staffing have remained flat. During priority calls, the call takers stay on the phone with the callers to give instructions on life-saving measures such as CPR or ensure caller safety and responder safety, as well as give up-to-date information relevant to a call as they are often dynamic situations. This keeps them from being able to answer other incoming emergencies, not to mention the additional call volume that has increased by 21% over the past five years. Police officers and community service officers do not have the time to complete the call they're on, let alone follow up on previous calls as they're often pulled from one unresolved crisis to the next. The most recent record, and I put that in quotation marks, that I have seen of 43 calls for service holding during a regular day shift. That's at least 43 citizens who are frustrated with our response time or lack thereof. This speaks to a culture of reactivity versus the goal of proactivity. Worse yet, feeling the pressure of having to respond, officers will try to handle calls by themselves that are for safety purposes should be a two officer call putting themselves in danger. However, what these, calls, what these numbers do not capture is the frustration felt by the officers themselves. If you were to ask any one of us why we wanted to be a police officer, while the words may be different, the sentiment of I want to help people will come through loud and clear. We want to help the victims of homicides, rapes, robberies, sex offenses, and family offenses that have increased by 18% from 2014 through 2017. We want to be able to respond to the 33 calls that we do, 33% of the calls that we do not have adequate staffing for, and we want to decrease our response time. I, among the representative body, firmly believe that doing nothing is not an option. These numbers will not improve without bold leadership by this council. There is no perfect mechanism that will uh, please all, but the initiative laid before you tonight appears to be the least impactful to most people, including public employees such as myself and businesses. It will ensure proper safeguards for the use of monies along with a renewal clause of seven years. The association has built. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Brittany Quick Warner, followed by Simone Knighton. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Brittany Quick Warner, and I'm the President and CEO of the Eugene Area Chamber of Commerce. I'm here tonight representing our Board of Directors, who after months of research and deliberation, voted unanimously this morning to support, with a few conditions, the ordinance enacting a payroll tax to fund this community justice initiative. While the board did not come to this position easily, we are supporting this ordinance because the alternative of letting our community's safety environment continue to decline is just not an option anymore. Their journey from, for some, opposition to support came with time, information, and extensive conversations with our members and the community. What we learned in those conversations is that folks are incredibly frustrated. People are in support of a stronger public safety system, but it is also clear that people are losing trust and confidence that we are taking all the steps that we could to really address these issues. Many had experiences where them or a loved one expected the police to respond or in intervene and they just weren't there. Others waited hours for a response and when someone finally arrived, they were told there was just not a lot that they could do for them. 
Several people admitted they've just stopped calling the police altogether. It is clear to us that we are on a slippery slope and it's gonna take strong leadership from all of us to keep from sliding. Given all of this feedback and the fundamental belief that a strong public safety system is the basis for a strong economy and desirable quality of life, our board of directors is willing to step up and lead on this issue with support for the payroll tax under certain conditions. First, we'd like to see a clarification of measurable outcomes written into the ordinance. Second, we would like stronger language in the ordinance to lockbox the new funding and to establish the existing percentage of funding stay as it is going into the future. Lastly, and most importantly, we believe that the city still has a ways to go to earn broad public support for this initiative, but we recognize the police department and supporting agencies need to be given the resources first to show the community what our public safety system could look like if they were funded appropriately. So we support council enacting this ordinance to give them a chance to show us over the next five to seven years how increasing funding will translate directly into a safer, more livable city. After that trial period, we believe the voters should have the information that they need to make an informed decision on whether they should be allowed to reauthorize the tax or not. We, we encourage a public vote. We as a chamber are committed to remaining active in this conversation and watching closely to ensure the outcomes and results as promised are delivered. Taking positions on controver controversial issues will always put us at the risk for unhappy members. Like you, our board was elective to support and represent our membership. We urge you to take the same position of bold leadership to unanimously support this effort as well. Thank you. Simone Knighton followed by Sean Haskins. Haskins. Hi, I'm Simone, and I am a mother of four and a grandmother. I'm on a fixed income because I have a son with uh, an IEP and um, ADHD and he gets some mental health therapy here in Eugene. Um, I would like to see some of this money go towards more preventive care. I, I have a 22-year-old and a 23-year-old and a 17-year-old daughter, and one thing that I've noticed with our youth is a lot of mental health issues, and they're increasing. And 4J school districts are out of, it's out of their hands. They don't know how to deal with it. Um, I myself have had to call the police on my own children because they're out of control. And I feel like it's really not the police's place to be doing things like that when they should be doing things like, you know, helping drug um, crimes or sexual assault crimes, which also I am a sexual assault survivor. So, and we take public transportation and, and we um, bicycle, and that's another concern with like the increasing traffic. And both of my older kids have been hit by one on her skateboard, and that was like three years ago. My son got hit coming out of a parking lot on his bicycle. And it's just, there's so, it's, the population is increasing, we're moving, we're thriving. And yes, we're gonna need police to be out and about and protecting our citizens, but we need some preventive community care as well for the homeless population, which we are gonna increase our homeless population if we don't help out with like low income housing. I live in low income housing. My apartments are filled with people who are under stress because they're on a tight budget. Cahoots and the police should take up residency in my apartment complex because the stress level of people is so much and the financial cushion is not huge. So we have a lot of work to do. I think that we really need to put some of this money towards um, mental health maintenance and preventive care for our youth, our elderly who are in fear of becoming homeless because they have like these costs for um, their medication, their minds are not strong anymore, they're dealing with all this traffic and chaos. I mean, it's just, it's, it's like a um, volcano ready to explode. And we need to work as a community together and stop like pinpointing who's who and what's what and put this money towards helping each other as a community. I would like to see more money towards 
community centers so we can work as um, a community of people in different hubs and locations and I'm also speaking for KEPW community radio so that's just my little bit that I would like to say thank you thank you Sean Haskins followed by John Thielking Good evening. Uh, I'm Sean Haskins, uh, Eugene resident, Ward 2. Um, I'm pretty much in the core demographic, I think, for what this ordinance is targeting. I'm a white middle class homeowner. Um, I am employed full time. I have a family. Um, and I actually am here to strongly oppose this measure the way that it's written, um, which is a little bit of an awkward position uh, to be in. I, I feel first and foremost that um, the tax primarily benefits uh, business owners and primarily um, is the brunt of it is borne by taxpayers, uh, workers, not by businesses. I saw in the discussion around um, the drafting of the ordinance that there was a negotiated reduced rate of payment specifically for business owners. And I understand that we're trying to be a business friendly city, but um, feels rather um, irritating to me when I think about uh, the primary purpose of what this measure will end up doing in terms of who will see the benefit of it. Um, I think one of the challenges that we run into is we, um, as a society, we rely on the police for far too many things. We've been conditioned to call the police about a wide range of things that police are neither prepared nor um, should they be uh, tasked with handling, which can be very stressful for police officers, but it also puts uh, citizens in a difficult situation, especially when we, cr we create the demand and then we're e expected to then put up more money for it to create an increasingly um, uh, institutionalized uh, state almost. Um, I'm, I find myself uh, triggered almost every time I walk downtown and I see those surveillance cameras with their flashing red and blue lights that are on 24-7, kind of reminding us that we're always being watched by the police. I've got no criminal record apart from some minor driving offenses, so um, there's no specific reason in my background that I should be nervous about that, but they still make me anxious when I see them. Um, I don't like the idea that somebody is monitoring my behavior in public, uh, other than like the other people that are around me. Um, which is the, the overall um, affect that I have related to this is really frustrating to me because when I first heard that this was that something like this was under consideration, I was strongly for it. I thought, yeah, we're going to be really doing something to fund infrastructure development that's going to help uh, alleviate some of the social problems that create uh, the kind of social crime that we have, the socioeconomic crime that we have in the city. Um, our violent crime rates, a lot of our major things that the police union chief was talking about, those things are dropping. If you look at the, the, your own numbers from 2070 to 2018, most of our major areas of violent crime and other crimes are actually in decline at this point. Our major areas continue to be um, where we've got actual increases, prostitution, not specifically trafficking, which shouldn't really be illegal in the first place. We've got some minor theft issues and we've got some domestic crimes and police shouldn't necessarily be intervening in a lot of domestic crimes. We can more effectively spend that money, that 65% on services and prevention. Thank you. Thank you. John Field King, followed by Ralph Parshall. I'm John Thielking from Ward 1. According to an analysis by Jean Stacy of the number of citations issued by the Eugene Police Department from January 2019 to April 2019, there were 10 times as many tickets and six times as many camping tickets issued during that period to unhoused people compared to the same months in 2018. In my attempt to follow the money on this statistic, I conclude that it must have been the extra $8 million in bridge funding that resulted in this increase. I don't want to see how many more unhoused people's lives in Eugene Police Department can ruin by writing more tickets when they get three times as much additional money if the payroll tax is adopted. You say that you want to implement the recommendations of the tax report so you can have zero visible homeless people on the street within a few years. As you continue to pass laws and implement policies that outstrip the ability of the band-aid solutions you do offer to cover the wounds that you continue to slash into the body and flesh of the unhoused and poor communities in Eugene. The nuisance ordinance expansion may contribute to the 130 people per month that are currently being made homeless. Thanks to the increases in ticketing, there will now be increased numbers of unhoused people who now have a criminal and financial paper trail following them around that will make it harder for them to get into housing when they do stumble across a few vacancies that are available. I say, why don't you just have the city of Eugene government do nothing 
and simply get out of the way, starting by repealing the new restrictive downtown activity zone rules so that organizations like CalCoasting.org and the BusStation.org can get the work that they have set out to do done instead of being thwarted at every turn, not by a competition from the city government that could make their operations unprofitable, but by a lot of physical repression that all but outlaws what they're trying to accomplish. Well, this time I'm not going to be chased away by some silly repressive law that makes life harder for my clients. Based on my experiences with CalCoasting.org over the past two years, I have concluded that having someone cow surf at your house or apartment should no longer be considered to be a short-term commitment. Soon I'm going to be rolling out a reorganized CalCoasting.org website that discusses the level of commitment that is needed to assure that the person you are helping can eventually get back on their feet. In the short term, people will be asked to either find unhoused people who can pay a little rent to stay at their residence long term, or if they wish to undertake the commitment required, they should understand that some people may take quite a long time, years possibly, before they will be in a position to start paying rent. Eventually, the income that I generate from the bus station or locker rentals for unhoused people will be enough to subsidize up to 40 people in the latter category in a program that may resemble the flexible funding idea and the implementation of the tax report as possibly done by the city where the expenses of this host, such as food and increased utility bills, are covered by city's funding. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Ralph Parshall, followed by Catherine uh, M. Murphy, I think. <laughs> or Mick Murphy maybe. Thank you, Ralph Parshall. I live on Elysium Street in Eugene. Um, Madam Mayor, Councilors and City Manager, uh, thank you for all that you do to make Eugene better. I'm here tonight to speak to the public safety issue that is looming over our city. I know this is a complex problem and cannot be s solved easily and thank you for addressing it tonight. I, like many in our city, are very concerned with the ongoing state of public safety in Eugene. I do not feel comfortable going downtown, would not walk on the bike path or walk in the Coburg area after dark. I just wouldn't do it. Our police force seems overwhelmed at times and just cannot serve this com community's needs the way all of us want it to today. After many years and these most current months, a solution is about to be brought before you. The need is there, and a proposal to help solve the issues is before us. If you truly believe that this $23.6 million payroll tax will make a difference, then I'm asking you tonight to vote unanimously with a real conviction in your hearts. The citizens, the citizens have elected you and need your strong guidance. I will promise to you tonight that I will support you, but you must be united in your decision that this is the best solution for our community. Alan, Betty, Claire, Emily, Jennifer, Mike, I am asking for your word that you will come to this decision unanimously. Our city deserves your strong voice. To be fragmented will feed division and this cannot be accepted. Tell all of you, Gene, this is our best path. Thank you again for your commitment to our city. Thank you. Catherine Murphy or Mick Murphy, can't quite read it. No? All right, we'll go on to the next one. Zandi Zinke, followed by Bill Whalen. I'm opposed to the payroll tax. Um, I want to share the context in which this tax is coming up. The council has given in excess of a $4 million 10-year tax break to one of the richest developers in Eugene who will rent a studio for $1,177. They have used the mechanism of urban renewal district funding to give to build a 15 million fund, a $15 million luxury park and plaza on the riverfront. They are considering a tax break of nearly a million dollars to Ferry Street Manor, the cheapest apartments of which will be studios, $449, and using the moderate um, income requirement, will still rent for over $1,000 a month. That's for a 449 square foot studio. The council has been the only city so far to pass a CET in which no new money is brought to the city for two years and is a weak, weak 
instead of bringing the potential of $30 million a year with that, those funds being leveraged, $3 million directly, has opted to pass at just $1.5 million a year, possibly in two years from now. So as they lean on us to tax us, let's just be clear, they are letting the money go to the top, protecting the developers. The, they have engaged in a process of manufactured consent. On July 18th, they hired a strategic polling, scientific polling firm, their Dr. Gary Mann Ross, let this council know that the, that the front of mind concern when respondents were polled, the largest category, people said their primary concern was homelessness. 40% said that. Public safety, the response, only 4% listed public safety as a priority. Then when asked to rank where homeless, where, what, what issues correspond to your core values, 68% of responded listed homelessness as a top priority, and only 30%, 37% ranked public safety as a top priority. And yet, if we look at how council responded to that information before the push polls, before the PR campaigns, that raw information, what they have done is now provide, propose something by which of $23 million, just 7% goes to homelessness services. That's just $1.6 million a year in homelessness services. In fact, in the first year, just the cost of um, enacting the tax will, will be more money than that. Um, in fact, they were offered three levels. One would be $7.5 million a year. Thank you. Bill Whalen. Uh, 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 no, uh, 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 no. I'm sorry. We have a rule, and I expect you to follow the rule. There, is, there are no outbursts. If you want to show approval, you can do this. That's it. All right. Bill Whalen, followed by Tom Brandt. Thank you, Mayor Venice and council members. Um, I appreciate uh, all your service. Uh, um, my name is Bill Whalen. Um, I live and work in Eugene. Um, I'm also um, the chair of the Eugene Police Commission. I sat uh, as a member on the Public Safety Revenue Team, and I'm a member of the Local Government Affairs Council for the Chamber. But tonight I'm not going to speak on behalf of any of those groups. I'm, spe I'm speaking on behalf of myself, a voter in Ward 5. I think it's important for us to um, look at funding our police department. As Director James, when he came in temporarily um, through the, the process of changing of chiefs, he painfully showed us that uh, how much underfunded our department was, that 30% of the calls were going unanswered every day. And that's unacceptable. We need to look at funding this um, and, and doing it through the ordinance, as it said here. This tax, I think, is a fair representation to, to look at people that are expecting the police and public safety services, people that work in Eugene. Um, we are taxing people that are working and are getting a paycheck, and I think that's important um, to do. And it's just, I think that this is one of those things that uh, uh, we need to act as a council, your elected officials, um, that the people have elected to make decisions like this on behalf of us, and I think that's important that you do that um, when looking at this ordinance. Um, thank you for your time tonight. Um. Thank you. Tom Brandt, followed by Michael Gannon. Yeah, my name is Tom Brandt. I live in Marcola. Um, <clears throat> If, if you don't want the people sleeping on the, the people in need sleeping on the streets in, uh, in Eugene, you should give them a place to go out of the rain with usable bathrooms, showers, and trash service. <clears throat> they will be used. Those that are truly transitioning should have better services to help them into employment and permanent housing. Others need help too counseling and programs for alcohol and drug abuse and those with mental problems. Those that have skills, put them to work building these temporary low-cost shelters. Timber, uh, post and beam, timber frame shelters. They could be open 
but with big sliding barn doors to close in the winter time. Uh, <clears throat> this putting them to work could lead to permanent employment for them. If we solve the problems here in Eugene, we could show other cities how to solve their problems. That would, that would uh, be employment there. There could be like a crew of people that would go to another city and another city showing them how to do it. If we don't solve the problem, you know, we're just wasting our time and wasting money on, on the police, you know, kicking them from one place to another. We shouldn't be doing that. We should give them a place. And, you know, the, the surveillance at the free speech plaza, you know, they spend all this money on those surveillance trailers. You know, I had a thought the other day, all they need is a lifeguard stand and a policeman sitting there. Cost a lot less money. You know, it's just spending the taxpayer's money because it's the taxpayer's money, it's not yours. I, I'd love to have money to spend, but I'd spend it in a lot different way. Thanks. Thank you. Michael Gannon, followed by Nicholas... Um, it, it Nicholas Engel, Engel, got it. Uh, good evening, City Council. I'm Michael Gannon. I live in Eugene, and I have a long list of issues that I think the city could work on and do better. But the one that I frequently talk to you about seems important to bring up tonight, and that is the inability of people to find a safe place to cross busy streets where there are no signals. And the state legislature has tried to help us out by uh, making a crosswalk at every intersection on every connecting every corner of the intersection, whether it's marked on the pavement or not. I've also pointed out that uh, it's my little personal war on global warming, because I watch people speeding <coughs> on a number of different streets, endangering old people <coughs> like myself, homeless people who don't have alternatives to cross the street, and children who are not very good at picking their way across super busy streets. And they're all over Eugene. This is a very car conscious community. And uh, it's been completely frustrating to me that such a simple problem that represents such a large danger to the safety of the community, and which is obvious if no, but none of you have called me up and said, can I meet you at a, one of those unmarked crosswalks where people are not uh, uh, stopping? And I pointed it out that in Los Angeles and in Sacramento and just about every single city in California, people stop when a pedestrian gets to the curb and wants to cross the street. So from a global warming standpoint, what does that mean? We're not, uh, we're not paying attention to how much gas is being burned up just to gun the engine from one stoplight to the next and forget about all of the intersections in between. So I want to, I'm an old time activist. I've been an activist on a number of issues in Eugene. And there are so many ways to change that behavior by the public at almost zero cost. And I see no effort by the community at large to address those issues. Go to the copy shop and make 600 copies showing the page from the driver's education manual and distribute it to the cops and let them give it to everybody they give a ticket to. Pretty soon, it would change. Thank you. 
Nicholas Engel, followed by Sean Winter. I'm Nicholas Engel. I'm about a 777th generation Earther, and I'm in all your wards all the time. You just never see me. I hope, Mr. Clark, that you can avoid using your phone while we're speaking here tonight, because there's some very important testimony going on in front of your emails. All Americans are entitled to fair treatment and human dignity. That's why I'm here tonight. You all want to spend my tax dollars so that they can lock me up again when I go to the ER and need help and not get it, get attacked by a doctor, a two-time honorably discharged member of the Marine Corps and the California Army National Guard who's got no drug problem. Guess what? They profiled the wrong guy this time. And obviously, I've heard enough testimony here tonight to know that the problem is not going to end with this silly little tax that you're trying to gouge out of us in order to provide your downtown. So I propose you take 65 cents out of every dollar the police department gets, 15 cents out of every dollar the municipal court gets, and put all of that into the homeless and give them nothing out of this. And if they want to be police officers and judges and uh, corrections officers, then they should take a public service promise that requires them to release their tax records, tax returns, and pass background checks every year, drug tests on a regular quarterly basis, and that keeps them in check because they are the ones running rampant in your, our city, sorry, our city. I came here from the East Coast because I thought this was the liberal bastion of greatness. I found the seedy underbelly here. Yes, indeed, I have. And so I think what we need to do is open up the doors. You all want a clean house because you've got all these big events coming. Well, guess what? We can have other events. This summer, I'm going to arrange an Oregon-wide. Next year, it's going to be a Pacific Northwest-wide. And then in 2021, just to add time for the games, uh, national, international conferences for the unhomed, the unloved, and the unwanted, and guess where it's going to be. <laughs> Thank you all very much for inviting everyone here, because I'm bringing it. I am going to bring it. I'm going to fight your hate with love. And yeah, I have to talk loud now, because otherwise you never hear us. The one thing the police department said that night when they were trying to tell me to get back in my wheelchair before they arrested me, the one thing they heard was when I did this. That was the only thing they heard. You know what? That's not acceptable. So take it or leave it. You can come down to the party. It's going to be pretty big. I think we're going to host it in the Whitaker because that sounds like a pretty welcoming spot. Thank you all very much for your time. And if you don't want your job, please leave it. Thank you. John Winter, followed by uh, David Madera. Mm. Hello, I'm Sean Winter. I own a food manufacturing business here in Eugene. I am here also to speak against the payroll tax. I am shocked that the city is not pushing back in any way on the budget proposed by the police. I don't understand why we continue to criminalize homelessness and then complain about all of the time that our law enforcement spends enforcing those laws against the homeless. Um, time and again, the police like to trot out the rising 911 calls. It's a statistic that is a problem. Um, but they don't like to unpack what those calls are or go into the actual crime statistics, which I don't think are rising. As near as I can tell in what research I was able to do, uh, crime statistics are actually flat. Um, and so a rise in calls to the police does not necessarily mean that we need more police. It possibly means that we need a public service announcement notifying people that they don't need to call the police every time they see a homeless person. <laughs> Moreover, there is no more regressive tax policy than a payroll tax. It is common knowledge that you tax the things that you don't want. Everyone is talking about how important it is for people to contribute to our society and take part in the city and work, and then, oh, we're going to tax that more. We're going to make it harder to get by in this city. 
uh, when there's already so many people living on its margins. It simply doesn't make sense to take money from the people who are making the least money so that we can have more police. I also do not feel safer seeing surveillance towers all over downtown. It's weird. It's not normal. This isn't New York City. There isn't a terrorist threat. It doesn't make sense. It feels invasive. It feels weird. It feels dystopian. Um, it just feels weird. People who, are, who, are, who don't live here, who visit the city, walk around, they say, oh, this town's weird. I don't know why you're living here. Chris Pryor uh, mentioned that it was important to have a payroll tax because then um, everyone would have skin in the game. As if people living paycheck to paycheck don't already have the most skin in the game. If you absolutely must hire more police to watch over us, which I do not believe that you do, do not take that money from working people making an hourly wage. It is cruel, it is unjust, it is regressive, and it is financially idiotic. We need to encourage work here, we need to encourage development, and this is not the kind of policy that does that. Thank you. David Madera, followed by uh, Devin LeBlanc. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is David Madera. I live in the Friendly Street neighborhood. I'm not sure of the ward. Uh, and I just came here to say that I'm against the payroll tax. Uh, I feel as, as a, a middle class working citizen that just another payroll deduction out of my paycheck that I have to figure out how to make up the difference. And uh, it's alluded to be a, a small dollar amount. The small dollar amounts always seem to continue to grow into larger dollar amounts. There's a, we're also facing a multitude of tax proposals by both local, uh, the courthouse building that, <clears throat> well, that you guys want to build, uh, <clears throat> state proposals. Uh, the tax were just passed that to, on businesses that will be forwarded to uh, everyone else through uh, <clears throat> increased tax or increased uh, uh, prices in, in uh, that the businesses will pass on. So that's why I'm primarily against it. It's just another deduction out of individuals' paychecks. Um, I also, uh, if your tax is a foregone conclusion, uh, which it very well may be, I would also propose that you take the homeless component out of the, out of the tax, because um, that's just a, it's a bottomless pit. We can all find uh, areas where, I mean, the homeless situation is a whole nother, uh, whole nother uh, topic that needs to be discussed with a multitude of different p uh, potential remedies. Um, also, I noticed in the, the brochure that is <clears throat> was given tonight that this also includes um, some funding for uh, after school programs in the Title I. I know nothing about what that's all about, but what I can see the happening here is there's always going to be, there's always, uh, government can always find a place to spend money and always taking it out of our paychecks. And as, a, as just an ordinary working middle class citizen, I have to find a way to, to make up that difference, as small as it may be, as small as it may be. Like the transit tax, it started off small, it's only going to grow bigger, which comes out of my paycheck as a payroll, payroll deduction. And I can see the same thing happen, happening here. And again, that concerns me. Um, I thought the pr an idea uh, proposed earlier that uh, put it to the vote of the people would be an excellent idea. So everyone can have a say in how the, um, you know, if they feel like they want to have money taken out of their paycheck or not. I, I, I presume and I, I would guess that a large percentage of the uh, populace is not even aware of the situation. Um, I, that I don't know, but uh, they're just going to all of a sudden in, in a month or I guess it'll be in effect next year, they'll just see a tax taken out of their, their, uh, uh, their paycheck and then have to make some kind of compensation for that. Uh, but that's my primary, primary objection. I agree that um, something needs to be done for um, additional uh, law enforcement and protection of individuals that have problems that, that, that arise, but uh, I, don't, I don't think a payroll tax is the way to go. Thank you. Thank you. Devin LeBlanc, followed by Deborah Messinger. Good evening, City Council. My name is Derek LeBlanc. I'm a resident of Eugene, Ward 4, and I wanted to come today to, to speak on, on the no when it comes to our, our payroll tax. I think, you know, realistically, 
a payroll tax, a tax on everyone. Okay, that, that trickle down to the working class, which will potentially affect the, the un unhomed. I know that law enforcement has a very difficult job right now, and I, I know that the funding's tight, but I think there's got to be better ways for us to find that funding. And you know, right right now we have a revolving door at the jail. I did look at your at your stat here, and it only increased 10 jail beds. And we have people that habitually commit crimes because there's a revolving door, and. You know, in my, my point of view, I don't think 10, 10 beds is enough. You know, we have people that commit, I mean, we are, we're reducing the, the crime for, for meth and heroin, and we're not doing what, given our law enforcement the tools that they need, but we have to figure out a way to fund it without taxing everyone, okay? And that's what this comes down to. Um, I, I do agree with those, those cameras because it's, it's, it's passive law enforcement. It's not designed to have a beat cop right there at that place. It's designed to move those people out of those shadows into a different area. So I, I do agree with those, but I, th I think there's definitely a different way for us to attack this issue because it's something that it definitely, it affects everyone, especially in the Whitaker. I go down there to, to Hot Valley and I see all the, I, I empathize. I empathize with those that are un, un, unhoused and there's no way for them off to get off the streets. And what we're doing by raising this payroll tax is we're making it that much harder for them to actually get off the streets. Because we're increasing the cost for everything. We're, we're driving up our property values. The, the cost of living is going up as well. And so this is all stuff that we, we, need, to, we need to address at the, the root cause. And you know, it comes down to mental health, mental health issues that are not being addressed. It also comes, there's a drug and alcohol abuse problem that's not being addressed, okay? Well, I, I agree with portions of this, you know, when it comes to, you know, the after school programs, you know, that funding can be used better, better suited somewhere else to help with mental health. So that's about all I have for tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Deborah Messinger, followed by Jerry Harris. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Deborah Messenger. I am a self-employed um, child care provider. I run a small child care preschool in my home. Um, I think that we should support the police, but I don't think the, and the homeless, but I don't think the payroll tax is the way to go. I think if you um, were to pass a payroll tax, I would ask that um, small self-employed um, individuals like myself who um, struggle to even create a job, and I have uh, created a job, a four-hour job for an employee, um, I, I, I find that, um, <coughs> that it, it pre presents a hardship both on myself and my employee to have to pay an additional, um, an additional fee and I'm already paying a transit tax. My employees are already paying a transit tax. Tax. I would suggest that you modify the measure um, to maybe um, give, give the smaller employees and the smaller, like someone working part-time or the um, smaller employers, um, the LCCs, for example, um, to give them the 2% break and I would say employers um, and full-time employees that they should be paying the 4% and not the half-time employees and the small employers. Thank you. Thank you. Jerry Harris, followed by Eric, uh, <coughs> I can't read this, Parisit. Eric, I hope you know who you, where you are. Eric heard you. Got it. Thank you, Mayor and Councilors. My name is Jerry Harris. I live in Ward 2, and I'm here to speak in favor of the payroll tax. Um, I appreciate Officer Clues' earlier recitation of our community policing statistics. I think they clearly show that we need to increase our funding for public safety. I would only add to his comments that we've seen a um, nearly doubling of the police response time since 2014, and it's a serious concern to me. And that, doesn't, that statistic does not even include all the, um, the calls that go completely unanswered, or the call time goes to infinity. Um, I do want to mention a couple things about uh, the payroll tax. I, 
echo Brittany Warner's concerns that we need to make sure that this tax gets used for the purposes that have been specified and that it's locked into those purposes. And we also need to make sure that the general fund monies for public safety do not get decreased if this tax is implemented. It needs to, the tax needs to go to additional policing and it needs to be really clearly done that way. I'd also want to echo an earlier comment about the ability to get um, uh, the public involved to determine if this tax should continue and whether it's three years, five years, or seven years. Um, at some point in time, the agencies using these funds need to be held accountable by the public for the appropriate use of these, ta these tax monies. So I, I hope, again, as Ms. Warner said, uh, that you will stand all together and pass this unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Eric, you'll have to give me your last name. I can't read it. Followed by Michael Kerrigan. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Eric Parrish, a resident of City of Eugene, uh, Ward 5. And um, I am here uh, along with the Eugene Chamber in support of some of the guidance that they have provided this evening. Um, I know that myself as a uh, individual in this community, I'm gonna get asked a number of questions about this and I've attended a number of the events that the chambers had and uh, different community discussions. And there's been a couple things that I've been thinking about that I wanted to share with you. Um, when I make decisions, um, and I make a lot of hard decisions like you guys do and provide a lot of guidance on hard decisions, um, there's a few things rolling around my head as I go through some of these numbers. Um, not necessarily written on the sheet of paper. So um, a couple of concepts I, uh, I'm thinking about is opportunity cost. Um, usually that term is around time. Um, so I believe that there is a sense of urgency to this. Um, and that's not necessarily on this page um, because we don't have, we can't run projections of what's gonna happen uh, three years from now if we don't fund this. But I do have some concerns that the cost would be much greater greater uh, three years from now or five years from now if we don't do something today. And so um, that's why I stand um, in support of some of the comments that the chamber's made. Um, the other thing that I'm considering is momentum. And we do have a new uh, chief of police, um, some new leadership, and um, that individual has cast their vision. And they're working with their team to build their team. And I think as a city and as a community, if we come behind our leaders and we support them with the resources they need to be successful with their uh, job, that they will do quite well. And I think that's important for us to support uh, the leader of that. So may you have wisdom as you make these tough decisions. And um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Michael Kerrigan, followed by Vanessa Ringgold. Uh, my name is Michael Kerrigan. I'm the Shelter Rights Coordinator at Community Alliance of Lane County, or ORCALC, and a proud re re uh, resident of Ward 7. Uh, on behalf of CALC, I oppose the payroll tax that is uh, pr uh, proposed tonight. I'm personally happy to contribute to a payroll tax that funds enhanced homeless services, the public shelter, the day center, and more programs that help uh, the, the unhoused. It's clear that we're facing a home homeless crisis and not a public safety cri uh, crisis in Eugene. I live and work in Whitaker, and I see and feel this crisis ev every day. We need to come together as a community and fund and provide safe shelter for all. Uh, helping make Eugene a human rights city that cares for all who li live here. So thank you for providing the chance to speak tonight. Thanks. Thank you. Vanessa Ringgold, followed by Kathleen Robinson. Hello, my name is Vanessa Ringgold. I am a resident of Eugene in Ward 6. Um, I moved here about two years ago, and I intend to make Eugene my forever home after many, many years of moving. So I uh, agree with many of the people who have come before me in addressing this payroll tax. I am against it in terms of how it's uh, currently allocated. Um, I am among those who think that homelessness is a more pressing issue, either as um, homelessness 
or it being contributed to as a mental or health issue or as a health issue in terms of addiction. Um, in terms of spending, there are many models. Uh, Salt Lake City comes to mind as being a model city who has treated homelessness by providing homes for those and who can have that stability so that they can actually improve their lives and become contributing members of society. Uh, I believe that the police are overtaxed if they are addressing these issues as either mental health or health issues. There will always be bad people who, who do bad things, but there are also people who need help. And if we believe in the city as a community, we are failing these people as a community because we are not addressing them as community members. We are saying that it's their fault, that they need to pull themselves up by the bootstrap, but only by a grave so will any of us go into that situation. So I believe that it is better to actually address this issue instead of, instead of putting our thumbs into dikes and other places, that we actually be bold and tackle the issue at hand and actually make Eugene a better community for everyone, including those who need more help than others. So thank you. Thank you. Kathleen Robinson followed, Kathleen? Yeah, followed by Carrie uh, Mizajewski. Hello, I've never done this before and I'm gonna be nervous so I hope you can uh, handle that. Anyway, my name's Kathleen Robinson and I live in Springfield and I'm here to oppose this tax because I am one of the working poor. I live paycheck to paycheck and um, I am a widow um, almost about a year and a half. And uh, life is not easy for me financially. Um, that's one of the things I want to oppose is because I can't afford that. Another thing, when I look at this, I see that um, not one thing on here mentions about mental health. Well, it says expansion, but it doesn't really give any good plans that shows what you guys plan on doing. It's just very blatant and very vague um, as far as how you're gonna go about doing what you say you wanna do by taking this money from the taxpayers. And um, that is a big concern to me too. So I just wish that um, you could find other ways of getting the money because I see a lot of money floating around and Eugene going to all these things that are nice and pretty, you know, but um, I question, you know, it's nice to have, but is it really that necessary that we have to spend all that amount of money on it? So those are my concerns and that's my thought. Thank you. Thank you. Carrie Mizujewski, followed by Stefan Struck. Hello, Carrie Majewski, Ward 2. Uh, I'm a former employee of the Eugene Chamber of Commerce, currently employed at Eugene Weekly. I uh, worked with uh, uh, the chamber managing the contract for the Downtown Property Owners Association and was part of the implementation of the Downtown Safety Network, which included uh, cameras put in, uh, private cameras put in by businesses. I'm very familiar with the conversation that's been going on for quite some time. And uh, I'm here to uh, let you know that I uh, am a pro-tax person in general and I oppose this tax as it is. Um, Eugene doesn't live here isolated. I think there's a much larger problem at hand uh, across the county. We have people in our rural communities just right outside the city limits who have some issues around uh, community safety and security and um, uh, we just recently, of course, had this bond measure fail that came through for the county courthouse, which uh, also serves um, cases that initiate in the city of Eugene, and our voters put that down. And I think that's a really big signal for you, and I, I think it's a, a flag that really needs to be paid attention to, and that it would be wise for the city of Eugene to uh, collaborate and coordinate uh, with the county and look at this in a much bigger picture, I feel that this payroll tax is lazy and it's not creative. It's the quickest, easiest fix that can just be put out here. And then I wonder then how sustainable is it? And um, again, I would echo what others say about the measure of prevention. We do not need 40 patrol officers 
that's an overreach and we do need more prevention. And I think that uh, some of the methods that the uh, city has taken in implementing some public, um, some community safety measures like the cameras um, are just kind of not done in the culture of Eugene. I, there, I don't recall there really being ever any uh, public conversation or uh, discussions around these cameras going up, the, the mobile ones and now these that are on Broadway and, and somewhere else. Um, and if you look back at uh, some other downtowns that have implemented some of these projects around community safety, it is a large discussion. And it doesn't happen in a matter of three or six months and just plopping down you know, a proposed payroll tax. That's not the way it happens. And the last thing I will close with is that. Thanks. Thank you. Stefan Streck, followed by Zachary Vishanoff. All right, well, thank you everybody. Happy Memorial Day. I am so glad that we took the time to say the Pledge of Allegiance because that's something we should do more often. I think it brings us all together to share in that and talk about our community and the country that we believe in and the people that live there and who we want to work for together. Now, today we've got this issue about the concept of payroll taxes and how the city wants to use that for increased security and other administrative decisions. But that's a problem because the city already has a lot of money and there's a lot of people who work really hard that give the city a lot of money and don't get enough in return. For example, I used to live down on 12th and Ferry and I'd regularly have to call the police three, five, sometimes six times a day to get trespassers off my front porch because they were smoking crack and drinking malt liquor, which I'm not necessarily opposed to. I just don't want it on my front porch. And I think that's a fair enough compromise. Now, when you call the police, they just won't send anyone often, not because the police officers don't want to go, but because dispatch won't send them. And that's ridiculous. I've had a million times where I'm ready to just throw somebody off the curb. When I'm on the block, that's my block, and I don't care how much crack or meth or heroin someone's smoking, they gotta do what I say. Now, some of them don't get that, so I gotta call dispatch twice. And they come down, and that's ridiculous that I've gotta make two phone calls right after the other, and the second person sends a police officer. Why didn't the first person just do their job? Why do I have to make two phone calls? And many other people in this city don't take the time to make that second phone call. They just say, oh, the city can't do it, that's too bad. And taxes to make up for that is ridiculous. Somebody else made the suggestion of legalizing prostitution. Now, I'm not gonna come up here and make that kind of suggestion, but I think it's you know not necessarily the worst idea in the world. But I'm not here to talk about legalized prostitution and the many societal, monetary, or health benefits of that today. I'm here to talk about payroll taxes and how payroll taxes screw everybody. Payroll taxes screw the employee. You know, when you're paying income taxes already, why do you have to pay payroll taxes for that money that you're getting that you're already paying taxes on? Then the employer who's giving you money has to pay taxes because they're giving you money. Then they pay taxes on the property they own. And you pay taxes the rest of your life until you die, and then after you die, you pay taxes. Your children pay taxes on the money you give them. We pay enough taxes. Thank you. Thank you. Whew. God bless America. Happy Memorial Day. Zachary Vishanoff, followed by Bob uh, uh, Fantasy. Thank you. Well, good to see some of you again. I uh, haven't seen some of you for a while. Uh, if we want to play the blame game, I'd say you guys didn't listen to Mike Clark. Mike Clark told you guys, use the E-Web building. Don't try to steal a bunch of new money for the city hall. 
So by playing this complicated shell game and pretending, oh, poor, the poor police ran out of money, you guys have some nest egg set aside for some city hall boondoggle. If you'd listened to him from day one and paid a dollar for the eWeb building and told eWeb, take, get out of here, you know, we wouldn't, be, we wouldn't be having this Groundhog Day BS. But, you know, no one listens to Mike Clark, so let's just go back to the other stuff. Um, how much do you have set aside for City Hall? Where's the nest egg? Where's the slush fund? How much? How much have you forgone collecting for the beloved MUPTI, the multiple use property tax exemptions? Since 1990, you haven't collected for certain developers, certain, certain high profile, low profile donors or whoever they are. Let's, let's have some numbers. From since 1990, how much did you skip collecting? And did those, did those buildings really benefit our civic space? Or are they just a cop magnet and a, and a total waste of resources? How many signatures to refer this to a petition? Are you going to do it in an administrative way so that we can't do a referral petition? If, if you pass this, can we do a referral petition? This is for city staff or your genius lawyers or whoever. I want to know how many petition signatures we need to put it on the ballot, because it's just not going to get voted for. The town square project. This includes the city hall, ripping down some nice area, the nice fountain, whatever, uh, indoor farmer's market we've heard about for, I don't know, 20 years that never quite happens. Um, how, how mu what's, the, what's the total price tag on the town square amount? Um, and then let's change the name to, of this tax, not to the police, not to the safety thing. Let's call it the 2021 uh, UVO sport event tax, okay? <laughs> and then finally, um, what about, if you guys really need this, get the lotto money that often gets wasted, siphon that away, it, it, it worked for PP, PK Park, or um, tax U of O sport tickets to all their venues, 10 bucks each. If you ducks can get drunk from seven in the morning, you can afford 10 bucks each for the stupid. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bob Fennessy, followed by Julia Taylor. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Bob Fennessy. I work here in downtown Eugene. I live in Springfield. Uh, I'm paying property taxes for the Springfield Municipal Jail and for the operating levy for such jail. Uh, and now you want to tax me 4% because I make just a teeny, teeny little bit above minimum wage and I'm probably going to have to work till 70. Uh, so. Uh, I mean, you all know that this is taxation without representation. I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know and understand. Uh, it's against everything that our country was based on. And I'm really, really shocked that you would even consider taxing people who aren't able to vote for or against you. Uh, and also, of course, the tax is very unfair economically. It taxes the people who have to work and the businesses that employ them. Those who get their money from stocks and bonds and property ownership and other types of investment pay absolutely nothing at all. Very unfair. Uh, but that's not what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is my own personal experience. Uh, I hope everybody got a chance to read uh, today's Register Guard about the, the mental health issues. Uh, I hope everybody here reads the paper, right? Uh, about a year ago, my uh, partner and I were going through uh, this problem. Uh, she has mental health issues, was off her meds, was manic for a number of times. Uh, once someone leaves the Johnson unit after the, they can only hold you on an involuntary hold for so long, the only other option is the jail. Uh, during the course of her mental health breakdown, she had 62 charges and I had one. Uh, 
this is an awful lot of the use of police and court resources for something that is a mental health issue. Uh, there needs to be something in between the Johnson unit and the jail. Uh, the police are not set up to be the helping force. There's a lot of people who have mental health issues and their families that are affected by them. Uh, and, and the police are set up to go after the bad guys. They're not set up to help people and families in crisis. <coughs> Most of the <coughs> money goes to support the same system of arrest and incarceration that doesn't solve the problem. There are lots and lots of things out there that will solve these problems. Thank you. Thank you. Julia Taylor, followed by Jason Johnson. Hi, can you hear me okay? All right, um, so I'm here today at my first city council meeting uh, to address you about the proposed community safety payroll tax. Um, I'm here because I'm angry and I'm concerned. Uh, I moved here three years ago, and over those three years, I have seen this town become even more heartless every week towards the homeless community, um, and it makes me really, really sad. Um, so for those of you who don't know, I'm, I feel like it's been covered now, 65% of this funding is going to add roughly 68 new police positions for so-called downtown safety. Um, and I'm angry, frankly, because police don't make our community safer. Looking at the bill online, I see the city conducted a survey where they asked people to share their thoughts about their feelings of safety in Eugene. And what that survey doesn't take into account is that it means something different for a white person who makes over $50,000 a year and owns their own house to be unsafe in this town. Ask any one of our neighbors who live on the streets and in shelters in this town if they feel safer with more cops present. Ask them if they feel safe when red hats and cops downtown harass them and issue citations for trying to survive. Ask most black and brown people in this town if they feel safer with more cops, or if they feel safer around cops at all. Eugene is already on the news for having the highest instance of hate crimes in the state, with Oregon coming out at number one nationwide. It's on the news for the white nationalists that you refuse to do anything about, and the number of houseless people suffering from this city's lack of compassion. Look at the number of black people that police have shot and killed in 2019 alone. As of two days ago, it was 47 people. Do you want Eugene to become even more of a police state than it already is? Is that what you want this town on the news for? I'm genuinely asking, if you want Eugene to be safer and for people to be safer downtown, you should allocate those funds towards social services like Cahoots, White Bird, the HIV Alliance, affordable housing, shelter funding. Where is that downtown shelter? Oh wait, you back down as soon as the Downtown Business Association approached you. We keep each other safe through taking care of each other, not through policing. Thank you. Thank you. And our final speaker is Jason Johnson. Hi there, my name is Jason Johnson. Uh, I'm in Ward 1, and I'm here tonight to speak in favor of the proposed payroll tax. Um, I am president of Impulse Software. We have 45 employees, 18 of those here in Eugene, and we're still growing. Uh, I serve on the board of the McKenzie River Trust here in Eugene, and I also serve on a national nonprofit board called uh, Rivers Recovery, uh, where we help combat, combat vets recovering from PTSD and other wounds of war. Uh, I am myself, <coughs> excuse me, a veteran. Uh, I've lived in our community for 14 years now. I live uh, with my wife and mother-in-law on Monroe Street in a modest home near the fairgrounds. Uh, in 2017, my wife and I considered moving from our longtime home near the Whitaker neighborhood to a neighborhood with less crime. Instead, we very deliberately chose to stay on Monroe Street because we love this town and want to be a part of making it a safer, cleaner, and more livable city. <clears throat> Within less than six months after that, my family personally encountered or was, in, or was clo in close proximity to numerous violent and property crimes in our neighborhood, including a murder. Uh, at, the point I at that point, I engaged directly with city, ma city manager John Ruiz uh, to learn what the numbers were telling us and what was being done. As we know, the numbers confirmed what my experiences suggested, that crime has been rising here and we don't have a source of funding to grow public safety in response. I'm here tonight to strongly support Mr. Ruiz and Chief Skinner's plan and to encourage the City Council to pass this measure immediately rather than calling for a referendum. We need to do something now to improve community safety and livability in our beautiful city. 
Finally, if the council determined that this isn't the correct mechanism to fund public safety, then please provide some leadership uh, for the citizens of our city and show us how to properly fund this important community service. Don't just kick, it, kick the can down the road. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that ends our testimony for this public hearing. Thank you all for speaking and listening to one another. Do we have any comments from councilors? Councilor Taylor? Thank you. Thank you all to who spoke. I agree there is a need for money, but no one mentioned the thing that disturbed me most about this proposal, which is that really low income people will be paying something every month. Um, I just looked up the someone who makes how much? Um, Minimum, minimum wage would be paying $4 a month. That's not much money to a lot of us, but to, if you're barely getting by, $4 means something. And if someone who makes $15 an hour, which is not really a living wage, would be paying $10 a month. And I don't know how many people have lived so that you're barely getting by and you're counting every cent. You go to the grocery store and you think, can I, no, that's too much. I have to get something that costs five cents more less or something. Um, it is, that really disturbed me that we're getting, adding another tax to people who can barely get by or can't really get by and wonder every month whether they're going to make it to the end. And I know, someone who used to take a lettuce sandwich to lunch at the end of the month because there was no money left for cheese or, or meat. Um, so this is, I can't vote for this as long, unless we raise the amount, raise the, the uh, salary at which someone would start to pay. Um, I think, I do agree with people who said we need to do something about homeless, we need to do something about homeless prevention, but people who are on the edge are just a, a little bit away from being homeless sometimes. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Clark. Thank you, Mayor. I have consistently said that I am in favor of the expenditure and that I think we are in need of, desperately in need of, um, the, the increased uh, strength of our police department. I have consistently said that I don't think this is the right funding mechanism and have recommended other ways to do so. Um, this is the first time tonight I've ever heard anybody else at the table say they w were, were against the idea or willing to vote no. I, Betty, I'm happy to hear that. Um, but because I feel that way, and so many people that I respect have been urging me to support this, I've, I've been I've been searching pretty hard <clears throat> to really kind of, you know, uh, focus in on how I could ever get myself to a place to support it. So I'm going to ask the manager a couple of things. Um, one of them is, uh, f for me, the idea of metrics around this becomes really important, especially if we, as the chamber recommends, put in something at the, uh, the five-year, seven-year mark to allow the public to weigh in with a vote. Those metrics for me are gonna be really important. And one of them, uh, aside from what they said about um, the level of enforcement activity and police activity and its measurement, is the, the measurement of unintended consequences or the measurement of effects in the community that we're not talking too much about. But I, I noticed, for example, that maybe, I don't, I don't know for sure, but maybe one of the biggest car dealerships in town isn't uh, headquartered in Oregon. And, and that's because tax policy drove them to Boise. And it, it, if you don't think tax policy drives business decisions, you're, you're really not paying attention. So for me, one of the things I'm going to be interested to note is how many businesses move their headquarters out of Eugene to Springfield or to another community nearby and how we measure that and perhaps even those that forego the opportunity to be located here, especially manufacturing that have an awful lot of employees. 
I'm going to want to find out if we can, and it'll be interesting to see if my colleagues will, be willing to put those kind of measurements in place so that we'll know the effect without having to have arguments about it. We'll know. Um, there, there'll be another, a, a number of other measurements I hope we will take, because I sense that this will pass. Um, and I'll have a little more to say with another round, because I'm running out of time here, so. Okay. Councilor Sayrick. Thank you. Thank you, everyone who came to speak, and thanks to the many folks who have communicated with us via email as well. Um, this kind of public hearing is where we get ideas on how we might amend, change, modify a proposal that we're considering. So it's really important to hear from folks from all different points of view. I just wanted to respond to a few of the things we heard. Um, the purpose of this tax is not to do more enforcement on homeless people, nor is it to focus on downtown. Nowhere in the language of the proposal does it say that it's the intended purpose for those things. We don't hire more detectives in order to enforce on homeless people, nor do we hire more 911 dispatch officers for that purpose. So I know this response won't satisfy those of you who think we shouldn't increase public uh, funding for police at all and that we should be putting all of our focus solely on uh, trying to help homeless people, but I think it's very important to clarify that misperception. Um, there would be dollars dedicated to funding a day, day shelter for homeless people and more emergency shelter as well as for our community court, uh, which provides alternative paths other than fines for people who commit nonviolent offenses in our downtown and a little bit further out. As far as the after school programs, those are a form of prevention and also help reduce family stress. So it might seem very unconnected, but actually research has shown that early intervention, early childhood intervention leads to better outcomes for children and families. Uh, some of this money would go to expanding our mental health court, which is another uh, way to provide a different path for folks. It's a tiny piece of a much, much larger system that needs to be greatly enhanced and which is really largely the responsibility of Lane County Public Health to expand mental health services for our community. Um, and the council has discussed exemptions for people on the low end of the wage scale. And I don't think that made it into the way the proposal's been put forward into to the public, um, but that is something this council has considered and will consider further, and I'm gonna be asking some questions about other ways we might approach that uh, other than just minimum wage. There might be other factors that we could consider for exempting some folks on the lower end of the wage scale. So thanks again, everyone, for taking the time to come out tonight and speak to us. Any other councilors wishing to comment? I know, just like giving others a first chance. All right, take it away, Councilor Clark. Thank you, Mayor, and I appreciate Councilor Surrett's point. I, um, it's interesting, there, I, the way this was presented during testimony tonight, and I saw a couple heads shake while, while Councilor Surrett was talking. I think there's an awful lot of people in the business community, especially, who supported this, who imagined that um, an increase in police strength of this nature will result in, in, in uh, more robust enforcement against illegal camping. And I, I think that the expectation set is present based on my conversations. So I, they, I think uh, some of those folks will be, will be surprised to find out that in fact this doesn't contain that, that kind of directive. Um, I will offer an amendment to remove uh, residents of Springfield or uh, uh, non-residents of Eugene from paying this. I, I think that the person that spoke to that, someone mentioned that was absolutely right. That those folks can't vote for any of us and for us to impose this tax on them is wrong by nature, but also, as the mayor of Springfield said in her letter to us, and the council, Spring, Springfield Council said in their letter to us, um, their, are, their residents are already paying for more robust public safety with, through their levy, and for us to hit them, those that, that work in Eugene, a second time really does seem really fairly unfair. So I'm, I'm probably gonna make that motion, but 
I, I sense that it may not pass. Thank you. Okay, I think that's our final comment. I do want to thank all of you for speaking. I will um, uh, agree with Councillor Syrett that uh, the, the ideas that you've brought forward do influence our, our discussions going forward about how, what this shape, the shape of this ultimate proposal will look like and the process that we go through. So very helpful, appreciate your taking the time. And that ends this public hearing. And I believe we're gonna take a, a brief break as council to allow folks for the hearing to file out and folks coming for the public forum to file in. So break. thank you all. How long of a break? Oh uh, yeah, that's a good question. Five minutes.
You don't allow signs, though, too. Oh, right. Good evening, and uh, I want to thank all of you for your patience. I know that we uh, changed up the schedule on you, and I hope it wasn't uh, too too serious of an inconvenience. I'm, we're now open for the public forum, and just a reminder of the rules. Um, the public forum is an opportunity for individuals to speak to the city council on any city-related issues except for those items which have already been heard by a hearings official or are on tonight's agenda as a public hearing. Each person will have two minutes to speak. Uh, when you come to the podium, please give your name, city of residence, and for Eugene residents, your ward if known. The timer and lights indicate the time you have to speak. The red light indicates the end of the two minutes. And I have... 36 people uh, signed up. I'm uh, guessing that a number of folks have, have left, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. So first up is Alan Cameron, followed by Becky Bruckner. Is Alan Cameron here? No. Becky Bruckner. And Becky will be followed by Joshua Korn. How many do we have total? I have 36, but I'm thinking it's not the whole list. Mm -hmm. um, hello, can I start? Yes, please. Oh, hi, I'm Becky Bruckner. Um, just to refresh your memory, the anti-commandeering doctrine was the U.S. Supreme Court's doctrine that interprets the Tenth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution to mean that no federal government agency can make a state or city official implement, participate in, or enforce any federal regulatory programs, which in this case would be the FCC Telecommunications Act. According to this doctrine, the members of the City Council would have complete authority to pass a moratorium halting the further placement of 5G small cells throughout Eugene. Betty Taylor, <coughs> Betty Taylor, at the end of the last City Council meeting, you asked the City Attorney if the anti commandeering doctrine would in fact allow the council to pass a moratorium halting 5G. The city attorney stated that she would need to get back to you in writing with the answer. That was over two weeks ago. <clears throat> I sent you an email today asking if you had received a reply from the city attorney and your answer was, I don't recall a reply. I then sent you another email asking you to check your emails and, and to tell us tonight if you got an answer from the city attorney, and if so, what it said about the moratorium. Please be so kind as to respond tonight. If you have not received an answer from the city attorney on this very important issue, please find out why. Time is of the essence. It is urgent that it not be dragged out any longer. The perception could be that it is being done intentionally. Thank you. Joshua Korn, followed by Adam Poggioli. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Joshua Korn, resident of South Eugene. And I, I've changed my, my opinion on this, and now I fully support 5G, because I want more cancer, more disrupted sleep, more adrenal problems, more reproductive problems, more birth defects, more compromised immune systems, more crowded hospitals, more profit for doctors, more profit for pharmaceutical companies, more military drones policing our community, to protect us because clearly pol the police aren't doing their job, more autonomous vehicles crowding our roads, more surveillance, or maybe we should have some logic and do the right thing and stop the madness. And regardless of the, of the, the power that you guys might think the FCC and the telecoms may have, we, this is Eugene. We are known as a progressive community that should do the right thing and lead this fight against big business and corrupt politics, regardless of the outcome. Thank you. Thank you. Adam, uh, uh, just, just this, please. Adam Poggioli, followed by uh, Kayla McDonald. Yeah, Adam Poggioli, thank you. 
I'm a local philosopher and health counselor. Uh, you can read my work on the philosophy and politics of science at creativecoherence.org. I was asked to say something here about the next generation wireless technology we're installing around the city. I assume this is only being allowed to happen without resistance because the evidence suggesting dangerous health effects seems unconvincing. One of the main issues with the science surrounding the health effects of non-ionizing field exposure is that we are dealing not with a simple mechanical cause. Uh, an effect relationship as you get in like an acute physical trauma or with, for instance, ionizing radiation, but with what uh, could be called nonlinear effects, effects that depend on the complex interaction of mechanisms and a body attempting to adapt to the stressors disrupting ideal organic function. This is always the case with long-term chronic stressors and chronic disease, but unlike, say, with the diseases caused by smoking, the level of complexity in individual response is naturally going to be much more complicated given the nature of the stressor. Uh, the telecom industry is in fact using some of the same players and games that were used in the fight against big tobacco, but they have even more room to sow doubt in this case because unlike smoking, wireless radiation has effects that are markedly nonlinear. This means that the effect does not follow in a simple, predictable linear pattern as you get by inhaling toxins in cigarettes. There too you have nonlinearity or unpredictability as to how long, if at all, someone can smoke before getting the rather limited forms of disease associated with smoking. But with smoking, the complexity in the response is easy to average out and simplify. With wireless radiation, however, you have a stressor not just primarily on one or two organ systems as in smoking, but a, a disruption in the communication between cells and therefore a stress on potentially every cell in the body. The nervous system tends to be the most immediately affected and those with ner nervous conditions tend to be the first to notice. Given the confounding of factors in our environment, the ubiquity of these devices and the lack of control groups, the idiosyncratic character of the way chronic disease expresses itself, and most importantly, the way our system diverts complex social problems into simple linear models and solutions that are little more than com commodified cover-ups. Thank you. All this makes the road to scientific consensus a tangled weave through the politics of science. Make no Thank mistake, you. this issue is not going away. Thank you. Kayla McDonald, followed by Mary Osterman. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kayla McDonald, City of Eugene. Uh, I came here last uh, City Council meeting to address the fact that the Eugene Police Department took away the umbrellas of the Free Speech Plaza Saturday Market area. First, I would like to thank the Council for uh, trying to uh, make sure that we had our umbrellas back. However, I would still like to address the lack of canopies in the Free Speech Plaza area. Uh, this is still a serious health violation and a human rights violation. Uh, we do not have any shade. We do not have any shelter. We are getting rained on. We are getting uh, the direct sunlight. A lot of us have debilitating illnesses that make us incapable of actually being in the sunlight without serious health implications. Uh, however, um, I would just like to address that the, the uh, that the uh, city of Eugene uh, should probably consider this a serious issue because at this point. Uh, with us nearing both June and July, the hottest parts of Oregon, uh, there will be some people that will end up uh, being in the hospital, and this will be quite frequently. We don't actually have the option to just forego uh, going to the uh, Eugene Saturday Market. A lot of us have debilitating illnesses, which make us unable to actually keep a regular job. This is our only income and uh, the Eugene Police Department and the Saturday Market is denying us of this right. And in this case, uh, somebody could end up dead, and I would just like to address uh, that the city of Eugene probably would not want somebody's blood on their hands at this point. Uh, people need shelter. People need shelter from the rain, not just the vendors, but also the people who are attending the Saturday Market uh, to enjoy the uh, atmosphere and area. Uh, this is unfair and this is unright. Uh, I have brought more people with me today to address this issue because I cannot cover everything in two minutes. But uh, thank you so much for your time and you have a good day. Thank you. Mary Osterman, followed by Patricia Duvall. Hi, I'm Mary Osterman. I live in Cottage Grove. I am here about the Saturday Market Free Speech too. I come every week. I've been doing this for over 20 years. I came last Saturday. I had to leave at 1 o'clock. I did not make a dime. I had to borrow money to get gas to get home. This is my only way of making money. 
Um, not having the canopies, our products get ruined, people get sick. Um, you've got, I've got elder customers that have been coming to me for years that I have not seen because of me not being able to have an awning for them to go under when it's hot or it's raining. We really need our shelters back. Saturday market gets to have awnings, we don't. We were told it's a fire hazard and one of us have talked to the fire chief, that has never been said to the Eugene PD and that is who's telling us this. They've told us it blocks their cameras. They're coming up with all sorts of excuses to violate our personal rights to have shelter, to stay out of the rain and the heat. A lot of us do have health issues. I'm disabled, this is the only way I can make money. I cannot work because of my body pains. We just really need our stuff back, not only for us, but for our customers that have been coming down there for years to buy our stuff that we sell, that we make, and that we use to make money so that we can actually make it through the month. Thank you. Thank you. Patricia Duvall, followed by James Hatcher. <coughs> Hi, my name is Patricia Duvall. I'm in Eugene First Ward area. I'm also here about the Saturday Market Free Speech Plaza area. Having our customer flow is getting cut down bit by bit because we're not having our canopies, we're not allowed to have umbrellas. When it's hot, the customers don't want to be around there anymore because there's no shade for them to come stand and look at our product. When it's raining, again, there's no shade. All our products are gonna get wet. They don't wanna get wet or holding wet products while trying to look at what they want to buy. So again, we would really love to have the canopies back to be able to help us as vendors and as the customers come by to look at our product. Thank you. Thank you. James Hatcher, followed by Heather Allen. Good evening. Um, at the last council meeting, um, Madam Mayor couldn't read my title. I'm Major James Hatcher, United States Marine Corps, retired. Um, I spent 32 years in the Marine Corps. I'm a combat veteran. I sell my stuff that I make at the Saturday market in Free Speech Plaza. And I've lost hundreds of dollars worth of merchandise due to the fact that we are no longer allowed canopies. Now, Ruining product, city council's not gonna pay me back for the stuff that I lost. I hand make all my stuff. And that's not easy. I sit for hours and hand make stuff all the time to sell at Saturday Market. Now, I see canopies all around. All around us, we've got hundreds of canopies, but we're not allowed a canopy, because hey, the police can't see us on their cameras, what they're saying. But we've even went so far <coughs> as to arrange the vendors in Free Speech Square where we're in a semicircle. So in other words, you could see the front of every vendor's stand and what every vendor's doing easily, but we're not allowed to canopy. I, last time I was here, I showed I had third degree burns from the sun. I'm just now healing up from that. You know, it's, it's pretty sad. I fought for this country for 32 years, from 1980 to 2012. I've got three bronze stars, two silver stars, three purple hearts, the Navy Cross, and was nominated for the Congressional Medal of Honor. And this is how I get treated. Thank you. Thank you. Heather Allen, followed by, hold it. Uh, Sarah Brandt. My name is Heather Allen. I live in Junction City, Oregon, but I have been in Lane County almost 40 years now in various cities. I have gone to college like you're supposed to, but nobody told me that I was gonna be disabled at a young age because of lack of medical care, proper medical care. 
I have no SSI, I have no SSD, because the organization that disabled me refused to admit to what they did. And I still have to find a lawyer. Right now I have to borrow money to pay my bills. And then I have to sell stuff to pay those bills back. Saturday market was the majority of my income for last summer. Now, I don't know how I'm going to avoid being homeless with these regulations. I have medical conditions, nerve conditions, medications I take that I am not allowed to be in the drug sunlight. I can't take it. Last time, the only time I went out there, I ended up with my scalp sunburned, my body sunburn, sun sickness for two days that made me stay in bed and sleep. I made $10 that day when I'm used to making an average of 200 a week because the vendors are so packed in there in Freedom Square, Free Speech Plaza, that we can't properly sell our products. Our customers are leaving because everything's too hot. Our customers have health issues. Even our healthy customers have health issues and walk away from our stuff. I can't vend because I don't have an option. I paid for a permit Thank that you. I can't use. Thank you. Sarah Barant. Sarah Barant, no. Uh, Carolyn Partridge. No. Okay. Betsy Hitz. No. Linda Heil. No. Jim New. I saw him leave. Deborah McGee. I saw her leave. Linda Perrine. Saw her leave. Susan uh, Macrusen. No. Philip Anderson. There we go. Philip Anderson, Eugene. I'm here today to propose that the mayor and city council of Eugene place an emergency moratorium on the implementation of 5G technologies. In an appeal to the European Union, more than 180 scientists and doctors from 36 countries warn about the danger of 5G, which will lead to a massive increase in involuntary exposure to EM radiation. The scientists earn, urge the EU to have the technology reviewed by an independent task force to reassess the health effects. Their official sta statement is as follows. We, the undersigned scientists, recommend a moratorium on the rollout of fifth generation 5G technologies for telecommunication until potential hazards for human health and the environment have been fully investigated by scientists independent from industry. 5G will substantially increase exposure to radio frequency electromagnetic fields on top of 2G, 3G, 4G, Wi-Fi, et cetera, for telecommunications already in place. Radio, fre radio frequency electromagnetic fields have been proven to be harmful for humans and the environment. It is foolish and irresponsible to allow the rollout of 5G with no definite evidence of the safety of this technology. The city of Brussels has halted the inflammation of 5G. Their mayor, Celine Fromolt, had this to say. I cannot welcome such technology if the radiation standards, which must protect the citizen, are not res respected, 5G or not. The people of Brussels are not guinea pigs whose health I, health I can sell at a profit. We cannot leave anything to doubt. You'd be wise to follow her example. As elected officials, it is your moral responsibility to protect the health of the citizens of Eugene, not corporate interests. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see, Sabrina Siegel. Sabrina, yes, followed by Barbara Wade. <clears throat> Usually I don't turn on my cell phone, I ethernet cable it, but I'm making this sacrifice tonight to share this video with you. Um, 
I wanna say first, uh, the 5G situation is a nightmare and an emergency, and you're really dragging your feet on it. It's, uh, it's a dire situation, a grave situation, and uh, we need a moratorium right away uh, before any more of these terrible devices get put up in our town. Um, I'm going to play for you Barry Trower, who is the foremost microwave expert in the world, who was hired by the British military because these waves are used as military weapons. The 5G uses millimeter waves, and they are used for weaponry and crowd control. So. Hello. I'm with Barry Trower, the renowned British physicist and microwave weapons expert, who has, in the course of a very long and very varied career, worked with the Br British Royal Navy <coughs> and the British Secret Service, and is the leading world expert on microwave radiation. Thank you, Barry, for this opportunity to tap into your very great knowledge, and particularly to examine exactly <coughs> what it is that's going on with 5G. And to launch straight into that question, I would like to ask you the following. As I understand it, with 5G, we are faced by a quite extraordinary increase in intensity of electromagnetic microwave transmissions when compared with the already dangerous 2, 3, and four. Reina, thank you. Make up the current wife. You can send us a link to that so that we can hear the whole. Yes, I actually did send it to you, and they're going to keep playing. Okay, it. I, I sent it to you. Maybe you didn't okay. catch it and watch it. Uh, she's going to start it for me because I have problems with my fingers. All right, and so you are Barbara Wade. Barbara Wade, thank Eugene. You. And Barbara will be followed by Isidore Siegel Coxon. In very recent history to be particularly more dangerous, even in areas where it has been set up, uh, in one report around a transmitter, uh, they found around 100 birds had died. In another transmitter, they found cattle that had died. Um, <clears throat> it is a particularly dangerous frequency because of its uh, high resonance. What I'm saying is that <clears throat> mathematically it is so complex that nobody can actually predict the harm it's going to cause. Uh, even the people who have made it can't predict the, the harm it's going to cause. Mathematically, it is a nightmare. <laughs> um, one thing that interests me is that the upper end of the 5G scale is actually so close to the new weapons frequency. Uh, there is a new weapon which its nickname is the Growler. It can be sent from aeroplanes or vehicles. And the growler is used to destroy the neurological and physiological systems in the body very, very quickly. This is used for crowd control. <clears throat> crowd control, or if you have an enemy, or... Um, so, in, in one hand, you have the uh, industry saying that well, they won't say it's safe. They will say, we have not found any harm. Uh, but on the other hand, it is being Thank you. used. Thank you. Isidore Siegel Coxon uh, uh, and taking over, looks like. Compatible. You can't have something which. You could play. <laughs> and Isidore will be followed by Alexander Red. Red to, to use it. Red. And in another, use it for crowd control. And to say that. Uh, the powers are different is absolute rubbish because with all microwaves a long low dose
can be equally, even more dangerous than a short high dose. So 5G is a nightmare. Already we are getting instances of, uh, I think it's 70% less production of fruit, 60% decrease in insects that pollinate. Uh, trees. It, it is suspected of already killing cattle and birds, as I've said. But the main, the main problem, as I see it, uh, and this isn't 5G, it is with the other Gs as well, but 5G is going to be much worse because it, it's going to blend into, in with the Wi-Fi. And Wi-Fi is a known proven and used weapons frequency. Um, <clears throat> shall I just carry on? Yes, okay. okay. Um, th th this is quite a long question, but it's very important for Poland. Um, I'll leave the weapons out, out for a minute. Um, the, the problem, that, as I see it, for Poland and countries that have huge forests, it is known and documented that, uh, especially with 5G added into Wi-Fi, <clears throat> but with Wi-Fi on its own, 5G is going to make this worse. It is known and documented that in three generations of humans... Thank you. Next is... Thank you. Next is Alexander Rezitz. Rez, I can't read this. Alexander. And he will be followed by Robin Bloomgarden. My name is Alexander Reitz. And, well, I've heard a lot about the problems you've been presented with and have come up with a few very simple solutions, most notably to the homelessness problem. A. Use the nice weather to set up emergency camps specifically for teenage, elderly, and at-risk peoples. B, start setting up, start actually using the money you're getting, like not to police, not for more cops. You know, take out some of the stupid laws you guys have been writing, because you're kind of actually useless and in the way with all that. And just actually start setting up the actual camps and giving the, uh, not giving the money to pretty much everyone who's been absconding with it up to up until this point and well starting work trade options that actually help people get back on their feet get the birth certificates and identification they need to actually become a more contributing part of this community instead of kind of in the way and ultimately using the bubble and empty buildings that you're using with real estate around here to inflate and push people out of their homes thus exacerbating your homelessness problem every step of the way just kindly get the hell out of the way because you're really failing epically. It's kind of like rooting for the Browns, a little ironic at this point. Peace among worlds, you know the symbol. Thank you. Robin Bloomgarden, followed by Michael Gannon. Hi, um, I'm in North Eugene. Um, I guess I'm the only one left who's going to speak in rebuttal to the Northwest Natural. Uh, from last week. So Northwest Natural Gas's presentation to council last week was a blatantly obvious sales pitch with no serious details provided. Betty Taylor asked a simple question, is your gas fracked? All she got was five minutes of everything but an answer. They're hoping that Eugene will bank on what might develop, but Northwest Natural has no contracts or firm plans for hydrogen technologies or power to gas projects at this time, and no funding at all. They propose hypo hypothetical fixes to Eugene City Council in exchange for no new 10-year franchise agreement. They've had years to start changing the way they do things, but why is it all dependent on Eugene buying in before they make these changes to save the planet? They present themselves as a partner. Remember, they are a for-profit corporation. They avoid using investor funds at all costs, 
always trying to pass costs on to others, including customers. For example, Energy Trust provides incentives to Northwest Natural customers, not the company itself. I'm praying that City Council will not be fooled by all the hocus pocus being presented here by a company that wants someone else to pay the piper. It's so easy to see that this is business as usual for a corporation that is accustomed to pushing its weight around with small local governments. Let's not allow ourselves to be steamrolled by Northwest Natural and their slick presentations and business practices. Eugene's ambition and the scale of its solutions should not be limited by the targets proposed by Northwest Natural or the state of Oregon. If they are not safe or science-based, it's that simple. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Gannon, followed by Tom Brandt. Uh, hello again. I'm Michael Gannon. I live in Eugene. I uh, have a number of things I'd like to be talking to you about, but as I sit here tonight, as I have through many council meetings, watching people give public testimony, I, I, um, I know that it works, that people coming here and talking to you change the results of your ordinance creation. But I don't understand why it has to be so difficult. I would like to think that we're living in a very fast-moving era, the fastest so that humans have been familiar with in uh, their process of evolution. And we're, we know that enormously complex issues come flying at government agencies around the globe all the time. And uh, a lot of people around the globe working in governments are not doing very well at recognizing the problems and jumping on them. And I'm not sure that you're measuring the dismay in the community from not being able to process stuff through our city council that is pertinent to the complexity of the world that we live in when we get online, when we look on our TV news, when we get in our car and we drive around. So it seems like you are really satisfied like in my case, talking for six years about an innovation in traffic safety that is working so well in other parts of the Thank country, you. and you won't do it here. Thank you. Thank you. Tom Brandt, followed by Nicholas Engel. Well, I'm still Tom Brandt. I still live in Marcola. And... Um, talking about the Saturday market, it's, it's amazing, 50 years ago, I helped get the Saturday market started. And the craftspeople voted me the first executive director of the Saturday market corporation. I needed a place to sell, to make money. I had a canopy. Of course, they weren't called canopies then, it was like a structure that gave me shade and kept the rain off of me. Uh, I think that uh, it's kind of really weird where across the street they have canopies and everything, but yet in this one spot, no canopies. <laughs> There's another reason. Um, I think canopies should be, protection should be uh, allowed. Um, and again, Spend money in a meaningful way. Solve the problems. Quit throwing money at things that don't work. <coughs> Ticketing people in need can't, that can't afford a fine, that's not what they need. The shelters I mentioned, the county has given enough timber away, just right where near me, they've given enough timber away in the right of way to the timber companies. Thousands of dollars worth. Enough, I figure, enough to 
build one or two of these low cost shelters, timber frame construction. Jerry's, I've talked to them. They're willing to donate for the right proposal. And I think, well, almost. Um, solve the problems and create jobs. And next time I'll talk to you about some mental health problems. Thanks. Thank you. Nicholas Engel, followed by Zachariah Humbert and Ken, Kendri, Kendra Humbert. Thank you, still from the same planet. And um, Saturday Market Park Blocks, um, uh, so-called free speech if you've got $25 for a permit um, without shade uh, is ridiculous. Uh, of course, the only canopies allowed there now are for the police department because they need protection. Uh, 5G, if you're opposed to it, then uh, you all should be chaining yourselves to polls to stop it. You should be ordering EPD to arrest any person installing the equipment, and you should be filing weekly injunctions at the circuit court. If you're not opposed to it, then you should be offering your homes, your kids' homes, your grandkids' homes, and your religious institutions as the guinea pig places for these transmitters to be installed, and then you all can tell us in 20 years what the effects are. Um, if we need to, we could do parades around Alton Stadium and the downtown on a daily or hourly, uh, you know, method, whatever's need. Red light safety is another huge thing. Why don't they enforce that? I've been almost hit by about 50 cars running red lights in this town and never seen once a cop uh, stopping people or tra ticketing people. Uh, the municipal court needs to be a court of record, otherwise you have no case for an appeal when you are unjustly accused, tried, and convicted. Uh, that's not happening now. There is no record kept. So if you can't afford it, then you should pass a law that requires them to be FaceTime broadcast each and every hearing and trial. Uh, the IAAF has already gotten my complaint about the games being held here in violation of the city's principles and their principles concerning the unhomed. And and I will be starting a petition uh, that will be gathering steam over the next two years to continue that force. Since you all seem to need a little more encouragement to do a damn thing, um, housing emergencies, uh, you should use eminent domain, take that uh, Brian Odie building, the, he got $32 million to build from us. And uh, six to eight officers are uh, arresting someone who's uh, passed out on the, the sidewalk, doesn't need to be done. And uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank Lots you. of love. We're going to hug you all nice and close. Okay. Thank you. Zachariah and Kendria, Kendra Humbert. Followed by. Oh, sorry. Followed by Wayne Martin. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Over here. Hi, my name is Kendra Humbert. I'm Zachariah Humbert, uh, mayor, council, city manager. Uh, we, we don't live in a ward. Uh, <laughs> we live wherever we can find a safe place. Uh, we came to Eugene three years ago. Uh, prior to that, we, uh, we had some issues in a town in Colorado with cops there. Uh, we'll just say they're not very nice. Uh, and thusly, we came here. Uh, and anyway, uh, it seems to be a little better here, but it's getting worse. Uh, we met Reverend Martin at a meet and greet uh, held at the barn light. Uh, from him, we have been learning about the TAC report, uh, which I actually have right here on my phone, uh, pulled up right now. Uh, the number one of which is expand and coordinate street outreach. Two, expand diversion and rapid exit strategies. Three, expand and coordinate rapid housing. Four, 350 units uh, uh, permanent supportive housing. Five, move on strategies. Uh, six, tenancy uh, support. Seven, coordinated entry changes. Eight, landlord partnerships. Nine, best practice training. And 10, 75 uh, emergency shelter uh, beds. Now, as I understand it, these are all supposed to be done simultaneously. Uh, some money 
that you've obtained is not going toward that from what I understand. But anyway, uh, it's a project with these 10 overlapping components. Uh, we're assuming you will appoint separate task groups to begin a plan for all 10 challenges. Uh, may we offer you one important piece of advice. Uh, please appoint one homeless man and woman to serve on each task group. We have lived under many conditions. Our lives, ex uh, our lived experience will help prevent you from making decisions and mistakes that might not have to be made. Uh, thank you, we wanna help. Thank you very much. Wayne Martin, followed by uh, Diane, oh, I can't read this. Um, Diane Laylet, maybe? Wayne. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, Council, Mr. City Manager. I'm actually hoping that you'll receive my invitation about an upcoming movie called Tony. Some of you may have seen the title. It's a movie that was filmed in San Diego. Uh, a local reporter there for their newspaper was uh, commissioned to do a series on homelessness and the journalist met Tony and was very taken by Tony. He hadn't been homeless for a terribly long time. He had taken under his wing a disabled older woman and was helping her cope. Uh, they were obviously sleeping in a tent along the main drag and they were being asked to move. The journalist was so taken with him and his nature and his story that he raised some funds from the newspaper and decided to do a broader piece. Um, and so the uh, city learned of projects like the one that Eugene is about to embark on in Atlanta, Salt Lake City, Houston, Sacramento, and possibly San Diego. They sent Tony and a crew to each of those five cities, and he was there for several weeks in some cases, sat in on the process, encouraged them to bring in other homeless people to sit on that process, and was successful in getting San Diego to adopt a similar uh, initiative. All of these, of course, took a lot of money. Houston is their most remarkable example. I urge you to see the film. It's showing June 6th at the Bijou Theater, and I've already approached a council person and a board um, commissioner to be resource people there. Thank you. Thank you. I am struggling to read this name. Lalette may be the last name. Nope. Okay. Uh, Sean Winter, followed by Larry Abel. Hello, I'm Sean Winter. I have a local food manufacturing business. Um, tensions often run a little high at these meetings. Um, that's because a lot of the decisions made here affect people. A lot of them affect people directly. Um, nevertheless, um, as, as Council Member Clark often notes, um, there is a need to maintain a certain level of civility as we have our discourse. Um, I was watching last week's um, work session that I wasn't able to attend in concert uh, in person, and I, I couldn't help but notice that um, Clark felt the need to say, I and a few million of my friends would defend with our lives against seeing our country changed that much. Um, that seems to me a not very veiled threat of violence in response to the potential of something not going his way. I just feel it necessary to report on the record that that's inappropriate um, under any circumstances in, a, in any city council and especially in ours. Um, it's just blanketly inappropriate, um, especially after spending so much time um, espounding on the need for purported civility. 
Um, I've been listening for the past hour to people tell stories of getting kicked out of Saturday Market um, because the city council doesn't want them to have an umbrella. Um, I don't understand why we're getting rid of the few things such as the Saturday Market that, differ that differentiate Eugene from any number of small town. Uh, I hear people, I, I, Thank you. Thank you. Larry Abel, followed by Elizabeth Elstein. Good evening, Councilors, Mayor. Um, I'm Larry Abel. I live in Ward 3 in Eugene. Um, so you've heard a lot about homelessness tonight. Um, I attended the joint meeting of the City Council and Board of Commissioners two weeks ago. I thought the meeting went very well. Um, City Council passed a resolution to back the implementation of the TAC report. Um, the Board of County Commissioners has allocated half of the money required to pay salaries for the people who will be implementing the program. And I was uh, concerned when I read in yesterday's paper that the city is going to wait till the end of July to do that. And I'm, I'm very concerned that that's going to delay the implementation, hiring these people for a couple of months. And I also understand uh, that the city has a million nine hundred thousand dollars set aside for the homelessness issue. And I just don't understand why at this point you can't take whatever that half of the portion is so that these people can be hired. Uh, it's important to get it going. Thank you. Thank you. Elizabeth Elstein, followed by Amy Cubbage. Hello. I'm speaking. Um, I'm with Eugene Ward 2, Elizabeth Elstein. I'm speaking uh, for the merchants of Wade Morris Free Speech Plaza that are now selling under the new downtown activity permit that's enforced there. i um, been selling there for several years. Always had a 10 by 10 tent. People could come in, get out of the sun. We were out of the sun. Now we're not. I am completely covered. I have a wide brim hat on, and I am continually getting burned by part of my face, and I can't stop that. We're getting different communication all the time about what we can have and what we can't have constantly. There needs to be clear written guidelines regarding the use. And there needs to be more places to sell with tables in the downtown activity area. Second, I question the need for even expansion of Saturday market or the farmer's market. There's hardly anybody that sells over there. Most people don't even want to be over there. And we can't have tents, but everyone can around us. So on the corners, we're effectively being blocked off. So it looks like nobody's in there selling. That is completely, completely unfair. I've noticed a decrease in business since this has occurred. I am, I'm appreciative that a lot of the drugs are gone out of there. Very appreciative of that. We're there to sell. We're, made, we're there to make money like everybody else. But we need to have that's going on. I mean, why do we now have to work under different conditions than Saturday market or farmer's market? We're merchants just like anybody else, all of us down there. And it's not fair. So I just want everyone to take that into consideration. People have medications that they're on, like others have said, we need tents. And we need large ones, not four by four. We need to have bring back the 10 by 10s that people had. That's the only way you can get the merchandise and people out of the sun to view your merchandise. I have merchandise that can't be in the sun. It gets warped. Thank you. Thank you. Amy Cubbage? Amy? No? Zachary Vishinoff? Followed by Stefan Struck. Hi, I'm just randomly got some ideas for you. Um, back in the hippie days, the uh, Saturday market was held on top of the butterfly lot. Um, 
there is a bottom to the butterfly lot. If mm -hmm. the people are allergic to the sunlight, let them go in the shaded area under there, um, kick the cars out, and then use the utilize the top of the butterfly lot. I know you want to destroy it for a city hall site, but in the meantime, that's a win-win. And um, but yeah, the the promise of the indoor Saturday market thing is a bait to attract the city hall. I think you should decouple those two issues. But I, just think about, in the meantime, you could use utilize the bottom of the butterfly lot for people who don't want sunlight, and then use the top of the butterfly lot for people who do. Um, I think um, for, for budgetary issues, I think you might want to divorce the two to police departments. You have the campus police department and the city to police department. Operating together may not be the most efficient way to use funds. Um, it may have been a mistake to join the two. You might have this, the U of O police police the U of O campus and then the city police police the rest of the town because it just seems like there's overlap and I think you're getting less efficient use of your dollars. Um, police commission meetings should be at, at an open location. Right now they hide them at the police station, which is not accessible. This room would be perfect. I have for many years tried to get them to come back to downtown. So that, that would get you good ideas and more openness. Thank you very much. Thank you, and our final speaker, Stefan Streck. Yeah. Well, good evening today, and thank you all for coming down to the public forum part of our meeting. I really appreciate that. It's uh, 10 o'clock. And honestly, I'm pretty surprised at the turnout we had. Wasn't guessing that so many people in Eugene would be against taxes. Thought it was the only one. But I'd like to talk about potholes and road construction, because every summer, it is ridiculous how much traffic is made from unnecessary road construction in this city. I used to live on 29th and Willamette. Every single summer, that 16 lane intersection gets repaved. It's ridiculous. Last year, y'all repaved Harris Street. It was perfectly fine, not a crack in it. Now, we're having Alder Street repaved for no reason. It's a perfectly gorgeous street, once again, no cracks. There are tons of cute little neighborhoods, bless you, buddy, all over North Eugene and West Eugene that are literally gravel roads with massive potholes that'll cause permanent damage to your car. And these people have been waiting since the city was built to have their roads paved just so that they can get in to their homes without having damage to their property. And the city's going and wasting millions of dollars unnecessarily paving perfectly fine streets and then asking these people to fork over more of their paychecks for unnecessary projects when the street that they live on has never been paved. I've met people, well, when I was in Amsterdam, I met a guy from Zimbabwe. He was like, whoa, mate. They sound like British in Zimbabwe, I guess, but he's like, whoa, mate. Y'all are worse than Zimbabwe. We're not that corrupt. I was like, whoa, don't talk about my city council like that. Yeah. So I'm, I got you back, but thank you. come on, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And that uh, closes our public forum. Do councilors have any need to comment on anything they've heard? Councilor Yeh? Yeah, um, I think he already left, Zachary. He mentioned uh, the location of the police commission meetings. That's actually something we recently discussed in our goal setting session. There was a lot of interest in considering 
uh, possibly moving the location that we have our meetings or possibly rotating the location around the city to give <coughs> folks more access um, to the meetings or also to create a more uh, welcoming environment for those meetings. There are some requirements um, for filming and, and whatnot that we need to work out, but I just wanted to share that that is something we are actively working on, and if folks have comments about that, you can um, you can email me or Alan, we're both on the police commission, or the police commission uh, members that are citizen members as well. Okay. Uh, Councilor Taylor. Oh, thank you. I, I just need to say that I did get an answer from the city attorney about a moratorium, and the answer is that we can't do it. The 5G is not yet effective, not yet in serve, happening in Eugene, even though some people think it is. It's, but um, we don't have the authority to establish a moratorium. And maybe the city attorney would like to say that. Is <laughs> that true? Yes. Yeah, you, you some, yes. Okay, I just yeah. went. <laughs> and if I didn't answer that last email, I have had so much email objecting to the payroll tax that I'm not have it caught up on my email. And actually, just interject that I think the question was about the anti-commandeering um, mm -hmm. question, which you did answer today. So I don't know if you want to. Did you want me to speak to that? Well, maybe quickly. Sure, certainly. Yeah, I, the the, the one-sentence answer is the anti-commandeering doctrine does not allow the city to adopt a moratorium contrary to federal law. Right. And we will talk that talk about that more. Right. All right. Uh, you complete? Okay. Councilor Semple. Thank you. Uh, I think maybe everybody's gone who came from Saturday Market, um, but. I want to thank them for coming back. Uh, I like to see persistence. It's how you get things to actually change. Um, uh, I've heard that now they can hold the umbrellas, and, and let me tell you, sitting around for eight hours holding an umbrella is pretty tough work. Uh, I'd really like to see us work with them to get the canopies. Uh, one idea was to not have walls on them. It gives you a much uh, open market feeling and still have the shade, but the the difference in equity is just embarrassing, and I think that this is a problem that we could solve, and I encourage us to do that, and uh, until then, I encourage the people who've already left or may still be here to come back. Thank you. Any other comments? Thank you all very much for hanging in there for a long meeting, and we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.